Now I want you to turn with me to the passage that Ralph Bell read to us, the third chapter of 2 Peter. I wish I had an opportunity to go verse by verse in this chapter because it's one of the most important chapters concerning the coming again of Jesus Christ. I want to speak on the day of the coming of Christ. That day, it's called in Scripture. Now, when you woke up this morning, I want to ask you, what were your expectations of today? Many people began thinking, well, it's going to be just an average day. Nothing unusual about that. Nothing out of the ordinary, nothing much to look forward to, just an average day. And then there may be the graduation day, or anniversary day, a promotion day, or a day in which you retire, maybe a day in which you start your vacation, or maybe your birthday, or the birth of a child. But tonight I want to talk to you about a day that is unique in the history of the world, the day when the Bible teaches Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth. And that day is on God's calendar. The Word of God says it'll only happen once. And it's going to come as a devastating shock for those that are not prepared. But for those who look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ, it's going to be a day of great joy. And the early New Testament Christians continually talked about and looked forward to that day, or the day, or the last days. These expressions are used throughout the New Testament. The last days. And we are living, I believe, in the last days. What kind of a day are we looking for? What's going to happen on that day? Well, first of all, it'll be a day of revelation. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. He's not going to come riding a donkey the next time. He's going to come with the mighty angels of heaven. It's going to be the personal return and appearance of Jesus Christ. After the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, the Bible says he appeared in person to his disciples and to 500 of his followers. But Jesus didn't appear to Pilate, have you ever wondered why? Or to Herod, or to the chief priest, or those that engineered his crucifixion. He didn't appeal to them, why? appear to them, why? Because it was not the time. They're going to see him on that day that is yet future. Revelation 1, 7 says, look, He's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. Even the people that pierced him, even the people that engineered his death are going to see him, and they're going to be in a state of shock. The Scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. In Acts 1, 11, it says, This same Jesus which shall, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. And they were watching to see him go into heaven, his ascension, and it says he disappeared into a cloud. I think it was a cloud of angels come to escort him back to heaven because there were angels that came when he was born. They escorted him to earth, and now he's going back to heaven after his resurrection, and they've come to escort him back. You know, before a great work of art such as a statue or painting is presented to the public, it's usually kept hidden. People may know what the work, that the work's being prepared. They may even know the location, but they've not seen it. And when the day of the presentation arrives, the artwork is covered by a cloth until the moment of unveiling. People come with great anticipation, and the event is often preceded by a ceremony. And when the covering is removed, the work of art stands unveiled, open for all to see. That day, the Scripture says, it'll be the unveiling of one who's been hidden. Today is the day in which Christ is hidden. He's not here in person in the sense of his flesh. He's not seen. Whom having not seen ye love, said Peter in 1 Peter 1.8. But in that day, he's going to be revealed. You see, this is a day of faith. We come to him by faith, but then it's going to be sight. We're going to see him person to person. And I'm looking forward to that day when I see Jesus Christ person to person and to be able to fall at his feet and thank him for dying on the cross for me so that I can have my sins forgiven and I can go to heaven and spend eternity with him. You know, in Eastern countries, a man is presented to, in many Eastern countries, a man is presented 
on his wedding day with his bride. The first time he's ever seen the bride is on his wedding day. She's hidden under a veil. And I can imagine the anticipation of those young men waiting to see what kind of a woman their parents picked out for them to see his bride for the first time. We love Christ, but we've not seen him. He's hidden beyond the veil. We long to see him in person. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, the scripture says, we will see him with his mighty angels. What a day that's going to be when he comes like lightning from heaven, like a crack of thunder. And then secondly, it'll be a day of condemnation. To believers, it's going to be a time of ecstasy and joy and excitement and glory. But to those who do not know him, it's going to be a day of judgment. God has placed within us a strong desire to see justice done in the world. We cheer when the good guys win and the bad guys lose on television. We applaud the legal system when it brings to justice a person who has brought great harm to others. We applaud the legal system when it does something to bring about social justice in our communities. Yet many people refuse to believe that God will one day bring justice to this earth but he's going to do it, and it's going to be on his terms. To every one of us, we're going to have to face the judgment. God is perfect in love and justice. God is a God of love. Don't leave here and let people think that God is not a God of love. The thing that I want you to remember most out of this whole crusade is that God loves you. No matter who you are, what you are, what your ethnic background is, how many sins you've committed, God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. God is going to keep on loving you to the very grave. He loves you. He is a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. And he's going to bring people throughout the world to a place of judgment and bring justice to the world. In 2 Thessalonians 1, the 8th and 9th verse, it says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting banishment from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power. Think of that. The Revised Standard Version translates this verse as exclusion from the presence of God. You see, what it really means is that we're going, those of you that are lost, those of you that don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you may be a member of the church and all that, but deep inside you're not sure how you stand before God and you may be lost to all of you you're going to catch a glimpse of Christ in his glory you're going to see all the glory 
and all the thrill and the joy of heaven for one moment, and you'll carry that memory throughout eternity, but you won't be able to enjoy it. You're going to be excluded from his presence, the scripture says. I remember when I heard about that for the first time from a Greek scholar at Cambridge University. I remember the impact that made upon me when he said that that's what that passage means. And I began to think about catching a glimpse of Jesus in all of his glory and all of his power, and I was to be a part of it in heaven, and I missed it because of my own lust or my own greed or my own pride or my own ego or because I wouldn't surrender to Christ on the cross. It also is going to be a day of salvation, a day of salvation. That's where we come to glorification. You've heard of salvation and sanctification. That is called glorification. Who are the objects of salvation? What's the nature of salvation? 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 says, rest. This indicates that many inequalities are going to be ironed out. There'll be perfect justice. The poor of the world will have their needs met, and many of the rich will become poor. You remember the rich man and the poor man Jesus told about? And the poor man died and went to heaven to be with Jesus? And the rich man who had no time for the poor died and he went to hell? And there was a great gulf between them? And the rich man cried out. He saw Abraham. He cried out and said, come and just bring one little bit of water. Just touch my tongue with water. And please go tell my brothers not to come to this place. It's terrible. Whatever hell is, it's separation from God. Heaven is described in terms that indicate the important thing, though, is not going to be our joy. Oh, I'm going to jump up and down if they'll let me. I'm going to applaud more than the people of Albany. I'm going to applaud the Lord Jesus Christ until my hands fall off. I'm going to kneel until my knees will be filled with blood from kneeling and giving him the glory and the praise and honor. But that's not going to be the big thing. The big thing is that Jesus is going to be so revealed in beauty and glory in and through us, his saints, that the whole universe is going to stand and marvel that Christ could do such a thing by his death and his resurrection, that he could take sinners like you and me who are opposed to God, who break his laws, who disobey him every day, And he's going to take us and make us into what he plans for the future. And we're going to share with him in reigning and ruling. He's going to be so revealed in beauty and glory in and through his saints that the whole universe will stand in amazement. You see, a craftsman is revealed by his work. Sir Christopher Wren Wren, was the design of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And I remember when we first went to London, the year after the war, Cliff Barras and his wife, Billy, and my wife and I went to England and we preached there for six months and the whole city was almost in ruins. But you could see St. Paul's Cathedral standing in all of its glory. It had suffered a little damage, but not much. And Sir Christopher Wren had designed it. And inside the cathedral, there's a plaque to his memory. And it says, if you seek the monument of Sir Christopher Wren, look about you. This is his monument. The monument of our Lord Jesus Christ, work on earth at the cross and the resurrection is going to be you and me. All of those that know Christ, the body of Christ, we are his workmanship. When the universe looks upon his glorified church, they will marvel at his beauty. They're not going to think of you and me. They're going to think of him. All of our thoughts are going to be centered in him. The universe will be impressed not by us, but by him who could accomplish all this. Christ will be the center of heaven. And in hell, wherever you look, you'll never see him. This is the day which the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, the scripture says. There's going to be a day when Christ comes back. Now today, when he's coming is a secret. According to a recent New York Times article, last year the United States government created 6,800,000 classified messages and documents. 
Now that's a lot of secrets. And of course we all know that those secrets have leaks. But God has one secret that he's revealed to no one. No one, and we're not even to speculate about it. And that is the day and the hour of his return. We don't know. But Jesus, before his death, took his disciples to the mountain, and they privately asked him, Lord, when are you coming, and what are going to be the signs of your return? What can we look for just before you come back? What will be the indicators of your coming again and the end of the world? or the world system as we know it, which is dominated by evil. And Jesus replied, Not of that day, nor hour, knoweth no man, not even the angels know, only my Father knows. But he stated clearly to the disciples, at the time of his coming again, there would be signs that we're to look for. And what are some of the signs that he left? First, he said there will be wars and rumors of wars. Doesn't that sound like the headlines of our papers all the time? Wars and rumors of war. Oh, yes, we've had a a wonderful time of peace seemingly break out in the world. And I'm thrilled at what's been happening. But even with all of this peace that's broken out, that doesn't mean that it's not a dangerous world. The Economist in London the other day ran an editorial and said the world is still a dangerous place. The end of the Cold War and the new relaxation between East and West have tempted some to believe that peace is the order of the day. The economists said it is not. We get rid of one big source of tension, the world still has a lot of little ones. Neither hatred, intolerance, nor aggression, nor even the clash of ideas died in the changes that took place last year and this year. Peace is breaking out, but so is conflict. And then the second thing he said, many will come in my name saying, I'm Christ. I'm told that there are more than 400 people in Los Angeles alone that claim to be Christ. He said there will arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. And many people today are teaching that we are God. All you have to do is to get in touch with the power that's within yourself. Unleash it and you can solve all the problems of life. And then, thirdly, Jesus said they will, the masses will be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And so that day will come upon myriads of people unawares. In other words, we're going to be having such a good time and be in all of our parties and going to all the nightclubs and all the excessive drinking and drug use the sex and violence, are major threats to the current generation, it said. And they are major threats, but Jesus predicted all of that. He said they'll be living like in the days of Noah, eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, exchanging wives. And that's all going on today on a scale we've never known before. The social critic and author Tom Wolfe, commenting on the 1980s, called it a decade of money fever in which the idea of sexual immorality came close to vanishing. Where are our moral values? We go to the talk show people, and they tell us what the moral values are at that present moment. And I know one of those people, and have known him for a long time. And he used to have strong moral values, but over the years he himself has succumbed until now when you watch him on television, you see that he slipped a long way from where he used to stand. Jesus made it plain there would be untold wealth and greed and overindulgence as we approach the end of the age. One newspaper columnist called our American lifestyle a Babylonian existence. And then fourthly, Jesus said there would be famines in many places and pestilences, not universal, but in different places, he said. And much of the famine in the world today is man-made, the result of political struggles and civil war. Look at the famine in Monrovia, Liberia tonight. 500,000 people jammed into that town. There's no water. The water has been cut off for 10 days. There's no food. There's no rice. And disease is breaking out. What's going to happen? And that's happening in many parts of the world. It's happening in places in India, and it looks like war between India and Pakistan is very, very close. 
And we see all of these things taking place now. And they're all things that Jesus predicted would be happening just before he comes. Americans spend billions of dollars annually on reducing programs when the rest of the world are just trying to get enough to eat. And then he said, iniquity shall abound. And he was talking about sex perversions. Yes, I'm not going to go into that here tonight because we don't have time. But the daily crime rate staggers us. The young women that are being attacked today and raped is 40% greater than it was a year ago. Something is happening. It seems like some terrible evil spirit has been let loose, and he has. It's the devil. Somebody asked me, what's wrong with the world? I said, sin is wrong with the world, and the devil is flaming the fire. And that's or fanning the fire. That's what's happening. And we ask ourselves, have our moral values gone completely? Almost. So that even Christians today are confused. And we become worldly Christians instead of Bible reading Christians and studying the scriptures and praying in our homes. We sit in front of that little box and get our moral values from there. And then he said there'll be an increase in earthquakes. There are some 6,000 earthquakes detected throughout the world each year. The average death toll from earthquakes in the 20th century has been 20,000 people every year. In Armenia in 1988, there were 25,000. In Iran a few weeks ago, there were 50,000. Earthquakes are increasing. In 2 Peter, he says, since everything will be destroyed in that day, what kind of people ought you to be? We now have the ozone effect. Everybody's getting concerned about the environment. They ought to be because in this passage of Scripture, it teaches that the earth is going to melt. It's going to fade away. Something's going to happen. Some climactic thing is going to happen. And it seems to me that what we're reading about in the ozone effect is the thing that Peter is talking about. And he said, since everything will be destroyed and changed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. The Christian is not a drop out from life. On the contrary, it is believing that Christ will return that gives us the confidence and the courage to live as we should today. Knowing that Christ is coming back makes me want to work that much more. I want to feed more people. I want to preach to more people. I want to help more people who are starving and homeless. It encourages us. It's an incentive to get out in society and do the best we can. We know that the whole world is not going to be saved, but coming out of the world are going to be people who will be saved. Because we look for a new heaven and a new earth as God has promised, and we live boldly for him in the context of our lives today. The Bible says there is a day coming when God will shake the heavens and the earth. It will be a day of salvation for those who know Christ. It'll be a day of judgment for those who don't know him. Are you prepared? The scripture says, prepare to meet thy God. Have you prepared? You say, well, what do I have to do to prepare? Yes, you go to church once in a while. You've been baptized. You take communion, perhaps. You've taken your vows in the church. But deep inside, you are not sure how you stand. And you want to be sure before you leave here. This crusade will be over in a few minutes, this phase of it at least, because it's going to continue in churches and it's going to continue in all the great follow-up work that's being planned. But you need to make a commitment to Christ today. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. The scripture teaches that you can harden your heart. God is giving you another moment, another chance to say yes to him. I'm going to ask you to do something that we've seen the last two nights over 2,000 people do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say, by coming, I surrender my heart to Christ. I want to be sure. I want to have the assurance that I'm saved 
that I'm going to heaven, that I'm going to be prepared to meet Christ when he returns. You say, why do I ask you ask me to come forward? Every person that Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. There's something about making that public commitment that he has ordained for us to do. And I'm going to ask you to do that right now, hundreds of you, that God is speaking to. If you come from up here, it'll take a couple minutes, so start now. God is speaking to you. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait. There's plenty of time. God is speaking to you. You come quickly. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you. Have a prayer with you. Give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. Just get up and come right now. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the 24th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. The 24th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, beginning at verse 1. How many have your Bibles? Lift them up. Thousands of Bibles. The 24th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. These words. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Now notice Jesus is sitting down. His disciples are coming to him privately and asking him this question, When shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the age? Now these disciples had been led to believe that the world was coming to an end. They had been led to believe by the teachings of Jesus and by the Old Testament prophets that there was going to be an end to the age and that Christ was coming back to set up his kingdom. And so they're asking him about it. Here's his answer, just a part of his answer. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are just the beginning of sorrow. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Every Bible expositor and every commentary that I've ever read in expounding this passage says that Jesus taught, that Jesus believed, and he led the disciples to believe that someday, at a point in history, there would be an end of an age, an end of an era, in which he would return to earth again. And this has been the hope of the church down through the centuries. When you say the Apostles' Creed in your church on Sunday, as many churches do say it, we repeat that he's coming to judge the quick and the dead. Every time you take communion, you're remembering the Lord's death till he comes. That's what communion is all about in the church. We remember the day he died and shed his blood, but we're also remembering the day that he's to come again. That's what he said. 
And if the Bible teaches anything, it teaches that Jesus Christ is coming back. Now, all the way through the Old Testament, I could stand here for at least two or three hours and just quote nothing but Scripture or read Scriptures referring to the coming again of Christ. When he's going to come in mighty power. And he's going to set up his kingdom. In the New Testament, it's taught in every book. Matthew, for example, likens Christ to a bridegroom coming to receive his bride. Mark, as a householder going on a long journey and committing certain tasks to his servants until he returns. Luke, he is a nobleman going into a far country to transact certain business and leaving his possessions with his servants in order that they might trade with them until he comes. John quotes Christ as saying, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. In Romans, we see him coming, putting all things beneath his feet. In 1 Corinthians, Paul tells of the Lord's coming to awaken and raise the dead. In 2 Corinthians, he tells about our new house, when we will have a new tabernacle, a new body. Philippians says that our conversation is in heaven from whence we look for the coming of the Savior. Colossians says when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. First Thessalonians tells us to wait for the Son from heaven. Second Thessalonians gives us the glorious picture of Christ coming for his saints. Titus talks about the blessed hope. James tells his readers to be patient unto the coming of the Lord. And all the way through the Scriptures, the whole book of Revelation, one book after another, is almost given entirely to the discussion of the events surrounding the coming again of Jesus Christ. Now, we're living at a very pessimistic period of history. I've had the privilege of talking to many of our world leaders, and I find them in private are very pessimistic about the world situation at this moment. The world situation, in my opinion, from what I know in my travels, is getting darker and blacker and worse. Whether you look at home or whether you look abroad. Now, the hope of the church, down through the centuries, has always been that Christ's prayer, in which he prayed, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is someday going to be answered. And we believe that it is far nearer being answered at this moment in spite of the pessimism than at any time in history. Because we are much nearer that climactic and glorious event when Jesus Christ is going to come back and set up his kingdom. Now the great question comes that the disciples ask. When is he going to come? They were wanting a specific date. What is going to be the sign of your coming? And Jesus told them in no uncertain terms that there were no dates. That he did not know the day nor the hour. And he made it quite clear when he said, but of the day and the hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But he said, I'll give you some signs to look for. And when you see all of these signs taking place at the same time, you can know that my redemption is drawing nigh. One of those signs was given in the passage I just read. Many shall come in my name in those last days, saying, I am the Christ and shall deceive many. Now we have that today. This indicates a resurgence of religion. Here we have the greatest divorce statistics and crime statistics in history. Problems sweeping the country. Almost anarchy in some places because of crime. And yet we have the greatest resurgence of religious interest in American history. What a paradox! What is happening? Our religious revival hasn't gone deep enough. And we have many people that profess Christ. Outwardly, they say they believe in Christ, but they're not living for it. Many shall come in my name. And many people will be deceived. And then secondly, 
He said, ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Kingdoms rising against kingdoms. Now this carries with it the idea that allies joined together by treaty will fight other allies joined together by treaty. Kingdoms fighting against kingdoms. Now this prophecy was fulfilled in the First World War. It was even more than fulfilled in the Second World War because for the first time we had war on an international scale that engulfed the whole world. Now Jesus said as we move toward the end of history, wars will increase. That's the reason the United Nations, with all of its good intentions, will not bring permanent peace. I'm for the United Nations. I believe we should work for peace. The Bible tells us we should pray for peace. We should work for it. But the Bible says, as long as the heart of man is sinful, as long as there's wickedness and hate and lust and greed in the human heart, there's going to be war. You are not going to eliminate war by scheme and planning as much as we would like to think it'll be eliminated. As long as man has hate and greed in his heart, there will be war in the world. And as long as there's one man in the world that has hate in his heart, there's the terrifying possibility that hydrogen bombs may fall. Now Jesus said, when war becomes that intense and that worldwide scale, this is a sign that is coming, is relatively near. And then another one. The third one, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And this indicates psychiatric problems. This indicates mental problems. This indicates instability. Psychiatry today is having a field day. Almost everyone to be fashionable today has to have his own psychiatrist. And did you know, I did not know this until we had a dog. And our dog, this particular dog, he was a Great Dane, had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> now, I never knew dogs had a nervous breakdown. Stuart Hamlin is an authority on dogs. And they suggested that we send that dog to New York where they had a dog psychiatrist. Now, that's a fact. I didn't know that before. Even the dogs are feeling the tenseness of the times in which we live. <laughs> we have millions of Americans today that are mentally ill. And Jesus said, when this tension begins to break you down and you betray one another, many shall be offended. He said, this is also a sign that my coming is drawing nigh. The fourth thing that he said, he said, is in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the day of the coming of the Son of Man. In this passage, Jesus said they were eating and drinking and making merry, and marrying and giving in marriage. Now, in other words, he said they were exchanging wives. This indicates divorce on a massive scale. There has never been a breakdown of a home such as we have today. Nor has there been a greater emphasis on sex than we have today. And Jesus said, when it is on a worldwide scale, and it's intensifying and increasing, an unnatural obsession with sex, Jesus said, that brings pressure upon the home, the moral problem. And it's not only in the United States, it's in Europe. It's all over the world. Jesus said this would be an indication that the end is not far away. And then fifthly, Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Think of that for a moment. Jesus said, just before the end, the gospel will be preached for the first time in the whole world up until 1500 A.D. Now that was only 400 years ago, 450 years ago, the Bible had been printed in only 14 languages of the world. Today, a portion of the Bible 
is in over 1,300 languages, and there's nowhere in the world that you can't get the gospel by radio. Radio and modern communications have now made it possible to preach the gospel to the whole world. Right tonight, I'm giving this message to more people than all the apostles and all the Christians of the first century put together. Think of it, in one night, by television, by radio, I'm able to preach to more people than all the Christians in the first century put together. Fantastic! Jesus said there would come a time in history, and if you had said that 500 years ago, they would have laughed. And yet it's happening today. For the first time. Now there's another sign that is given us in the New Testament, because Paul talked a great deal, and the other apostles about the end, and about the coming again of Christ. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. In other words, there's going to be a falling away from the faith. Christians who had professed Christ falling away, either intellectually, theologically, or morally, and every day we hear stories of people who are falling by the wayside under the impact of satanic power. Moral failures falling away from the faith they once held. And even men who preach the gospel, who deny the Bible, I read about a preacher the other day in England who said that the Bible is the greatest stumbling block to world brotherhood. Let's do away with the Bible, he said. It was in the New York Times this past week. I could hardly believe it when I read it. Falling away, Jesus said, when that takes place, it's a sign that the end is near. And then... The Scripture talks about a worldwide lawlessness. Listen to this. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. He said in the last days, all of that would be characteristic of that generation. And it sounds like you're reading a newspaper or a sociologist of the 20th century describing the problems we face today. And then the scripture says in 2 Peter that in the last days there would be scoffers. There shall come in the last days scoffers, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And we have those scoffers today coming along. They say, why, Christ is not coming? That's a fantastic thing to be telling the people. Why, 2,000 years have passed, Christ hasn't come. That's what Peter said they'd be saying. He said, as you approach the end, and all the signs are evident that Christ's coming is near, they would be scoffers. Who would say why everything's continued since he left here? He hasn't come. So we assume that he's not coming. We've misinterpreted the scriptures. We've misinterpreted the Bible. No, he's coming. The scripture says he's coming. Every time we take communion, we say he's coming. Every time we repeat the Apostles' Creed, we say he's coming. He's coming! And the signs point to the fact that it may be near though we do not know the day nor the hour. And the Bible says that when he comes, we Christians will not be expecting him. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Do you think he's coming tonight? All right, he said in such an hour as ye think not, he's coming. 
And then the scripture says that in the latter days, travel and knowledge would increase. I could go on and on and on. I have listed about 32 things, but I can only get to a few of them tonight. But thou, old Daniel, shut up the words and see. The book, even in the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. As we approach the end, the prophet Daniel said hundreds of years before Christ that knowledge would increase and travel would increase. A hundred years ago, my grandfather was living. He fought. Both of my grandfathers fought in the Civil War. If I had told my, if I could rise and tell my grandfather at that time, Grandfather, someday men will be flying through the air at 2,000 miles an hour. They would have put me in a mental institution. That's right. Because men in those days were still traveling almost with very little acceleration, the same as they traveled for hundreds of years. Travel increasing. How did Daniel know about that? How did he know that someday there would be a, an acceleration of travel? Why, if you had told me when I was a boy that I could sit at home and look at a screen in my home and that somewhere in the airways they'd pull pictures out that talk, I would have thought you were crazy. Just the change in my lifetime. I played golf today with Freeman Gosda, who played Amos and Andy. You remember? Well, I remember when my father got us the first crystal set at home, way back in the early 1920s. And I remember that we, we fixed it, and then we got earphones and listened to KDKA in Pittsburgh, and there was Amos and Andy. Why, it was the greatest thing in the world to be able to listen all the way to Pittsburgh from North Carolina. When I tell my children that, they, they want me to drop dead. <laughs> they think I'm ancient. Why, my children have never known a day when they didn't have television. And they can't imagine the ancient world where there was no TV. <laughs> there are so many things. I could spend all evening just talking about Israel and the Jew. God's timepiece. This wonderful, magnificent people chosen of God. Their country destroyed in 586 B.C. by Nebuchadnezzar. And the Bible all the way through from one end to the other in scores of scriptures predicted there would come a day when they would be gathered from all over the world back to their own land. And in 1948, when President Truman recognized Israel as a state and the United Nations declared it as a state, for the first time in 2,500 years, and the Bible had predicted that these people, only 13 million in the whole world, scattered in the whole world, would be drawn back to their own land. How amazing, how wonderful! And everything we study in the Scriptures the same way. Then Jesus said, there'll come a day toward the end. In Luke, he said this. Upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, men's hearts failing them for fear, and looking after those things coming on the earth. He said, there will come a day when men's hearts are literally going to fail them because of fear. Now, what could make a man that afraid? Hydrogen bomb. On a world scale? Or we could take Second Peter, the third chapter, where it talks about the elements being melted with a fervent heat, and everybody laughs at that passage until the first atomic bomb fell. And then the Bible says that as we approach the end, there will be the development of the spirit of Antichrist. And toward the end, and at the end, this satanic power will be centered in a person. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there coming a falling away first, and that man of sin revealed the son of perdition. The Bible says there's coming a day when the Holy Spirit, who is now in the world, will be withdrawn, and the forces of evil will take over the entire world. 
and Antichrist will appear. And there will be persecution and suffering such as the world has never known. But then the Bible says that will set the stage in a short time for Christ coming. But before that day happens, we believe that every person in Jesus Christ is going to be caught in the air to meet him. What a glorious day that's going to be. I'm looking for him any time. You see, he says that the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds. What a glorious hope that is. This is the hope of the church, and this is what we ought to be preaching, that God has a plan for the future, that history is not wandering around purposelessly. There's a plan, there's a program. And that plan and program is that Christ shall reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. And that you and I, if we are believers in Christ, if we have received him, we are going to be a part of that kingdom. Yes, the world is going to know peace. The dream that Martin Luther King talked about in the March on Washington is going to come true someday, but not by the efforts of man alone, but by the coming of Christ. When Christ shall set up his kingdom, then we will have world brotherhood. Then there will be no more war or suffering. What a world it's going to be. And you and I in Christ are going to be in that world. And the Christian is silent on the very point that he ought to be preaching on. And it's the fact that Jesus Christ is going to set up a kingdom. And that kingdom will be the time when there will be permanent peace and Christ will be the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, for those people who reject Christ and turn away from Christ, it's going to be a terrible time of judgment. But to those that have received him, those that have been born again, those that have Christ in their hearts, it's going to be a glorious time. Now, Christ, the scriptures indicate that when you receive Christ, you may have suffering for the rest of your time down here. Now, let's say you have another five years to live, or ten years to live, or twenty years to live. Now, the Bible says you may have suffering. There may be persecution, misunderstanding, troubles and difficulties, but his peace and his joy and his power will be yours. But he says, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart, what God has prepared for them that know him. Are you ready to meet him? The scripture says there are three things. First, we should watch. He said, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord cometh. Are you watching for his coming? Secondly, we are to purify ourselves. This means that we are to live clean lives. And if there's sin in your life, come to Christ tonight. Let him cleanse it and wash it away and be purified by his blood. And thirdly, the scripture says, prepare, therefore be ye ready. Are you ready? Prepare to meet thy God. If you are not prepared to meet God, prepare tonight. You say, what do I have to do to prepare? First, repent of your sin. Secondly, by faith receiving. You say, how long does that take? You can do it that quick by making a decision in your heart right now to receive him. It means that you are willing to turn from your sins and receive him as your own Lord, Master, and Savior. And you can do it right tonight, right here, and be ready. And you say, Lord, I want you to lead and direct in my life. I want you to have all of me. And if you'll say that, and if you'll make that commitment, and you want to be prepared, and you're not sure that you're ready, you're not certain that you know Christ for yourself. Now, you may be a member of the church, but you're not sure that you know Christ for yourself. You haven't had a real encounter with him. I'm going to ask you to come and receive him tonight and say, Lord, I'm stepping out on Jesus' side. I want to be in his kingdom, and I'm willing, if necessary, to suffer here in order to share the glory there. I'm willing to be his witness and his servant here in order to share the glory there. 
Now, you have to come by faith. You can't reason all this out. Some of it sounds rather fantastic to the modern mind, but not so fantastic as it used to seem, because modern science has shown us that all of these things can take place now. I'm going to ask you to come by faith, a step of faith. You may be a professor. You may be a student. I don't know who you are, what you are. But I want you to get up out of your seat right now and come out on this field and say yes to Christ. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. Now, why do I ask you to come? Because Jesus Christ hung on the cross for your sins openly. He said, if you're not willing to confess me openly before men, I'll not confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. Or you can bring your friend with you. And after you've come here, we're going to say a word to you, give you a verse of Scripture. And then you can go back and join your friend. But there's something about coming forward that settles it in your life. It's saying, I will to Christ to have all the sin forgiven and to know that if you died, you'd go to heaven or that you're ready to meet Christ should he come back today. We're going to wait on you, hundreds of you right now, men, women, young people. Some of you have been here on other nights. You've made a decision in your heart, but you haven't said it openly yet. You come. We're going to wait right now. And just come and stand here quietly with bowed head and say tonight, I want Christ to be my Lord and my Savior and my Master. We're going to wait quickly. Now I want you to turn for our text this afternoon to first or second, pardon me, second Thessalonians, the first chapter, beginning at the seventh verse. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. I want to speak on the subject this afternoon, that day, all the way through the Bible, you find a reference that day, the day. What does it mean? There's a film being made here in the city of Melbourne that has attracted a great deal of attention entitled On the Beach. Gregory Peck and Ava Gardner are playing in that film and you've seen them filming all around town. I've seen them a couple times as they've been filming on various locations here. And it comes from a best-selling novel that I have in my hand entitled On the Beach by Neville Shute, who is an author from right here in Melbourne. And the setting of this book is right here in Melbourne. Most of you, I imagine, have read it. It has to do with the end of the world. When an atomic war takes place and destroys all of civilization in the end. Now, if a minister got in the pulpit and preached 
what is in this novel, he would be called sensational, he would be frightening the people, he would be called over-emotional. But this book has been termed a tremendous success, and it's being filmed, and the film will be a great success. And yet I hold in my hand another book. It is not fiction. It is the authority of God's holy word, the holy scripture that has a great deal to say about the end of the world. It has a great deal to say about that day, that day that is yet to come upon the world. And I want us to think about that day this afternoon. Many people today are making statements. Many of our scientists have already been quoted. Professor Compton said right here in Australia recently, the possibilities are that the world can be destroyed. The Archbishop of Canterbury stirred a controversy at Lambeth Conference when he talked about the possibility of God's will that man should destroy himself. Canon Brian Green, uh, the rector of Birmingham, England, was here in Australia recently, and from the press I clipped this statement from him. He told 100 Anglican clergymen that, quote, I really feel we are going to move into a dark age for civilization. The only real light for Christians is a faith in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Christopher Dawson, a Roman Catholic philosopher, in his book, Judgment of the Nations, says, civilization is like a ship being driven massless and rudderless before the storm hastening to the judgment of the Almighty. And I could give many quotes from some of our outstanding clergymen, theologians, from the Protestant and Catholic and Jewish churches. I could give you many quotes from scientists, diplomats, political leaders, leaders of labor and industry to prove to you that mankind today is thinking about the awesome possibility of that day. And yet, strange to say, the pulpit is almost silent on this subject. And yet, all the way through the New Testament, the Bible is teaching that there is a day of hope that is coming. We Christians need not be pessimistic. We need not bury our head in the sand. We need not go around with a long face because the Bible has what is called a blessed hope for every true child of God. All the way through the New Testament, we have this strange expression, that day. What does it mean? In 2 Thessalonians 1.12, we read these words, 2 Timothy 1.12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Now, what did Paul mean? He said, I am persuaded that the sins I have committed will be kept by God until that day. What day? And then in 2 Timothy 1.18, these words, The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. What does the Bible mean? That day. 2 Timothy 4.8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day. What does he mean, that day? Hebrews 10, 25 from the Bible. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And so much the more as ye see the day approaching. What day? 
It's called the day, that day. 1 Corinthians 3.13 Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. What day? It doesn't say, it says the day, that day. Romans 13.12 The night is far spent. The day is at hand. And in our text that we've already read, it talks about the day, that day. And I want you to see from the text that we've read from 2 Thessalonians, three things about that day. First, it will be a day of revelation. And all of history is moving toward that day. And the scripture indicates it'll be a day of revelation. Here's what the scripture says. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. There is coming a day, a day, a time in history when Christ is going to come with his angels. The day, that day, that's where history is moving. That's the future of the world. The coming of Christ. The personal return and appearance of Christ. And his coming is described in this passage actually in three words. They're Greek words. Parkusia, the personal presence of Christ. That means he will come in person. It's not just a spirit that comes. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which has been taken from you, shall so come in like manner. On ascension day in the church, we remember the day that Jesus was taken up from the disciples. He went into the glory. He disappeared in a cloud. He went up personally in his resurrected body. He shall so come in like manna, a personal return of Jesus Christ. And then there's another word that is epiphania. That means appearing. That carries with it the idea of appearing out of the darkness as a star that has been all day hidden and suddenly comes into view. In other words, if you look up into the sky now, you cannot see a star. But the stars are there. They're there right now. They're just hidden from view. But tonight, the stars will come out and we'll see them. That's exactly the meaning here. Our Lord Jesus Christ is hidden from view at the moment. He is not here in the flesh. Him whom we have not seen, yet we love. We Christians love him, but we've never seen him. You've never touched him with your finger. You've never heard him speak with your ear. You've never seen him with your natural eye. And yet he's there. But in that day that is yet to come, he will reveal himself in person. And we will see him. Today, we receive Christ by faith. The word faith is used 92 times in the Gospel of John alone. All the way through the Bible, it is faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that God had raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. We are saved by faith. Faith in Christ. We don't see him. We don't hear him. We don't touch him. But we know he's there, as Martin Luther said, just as though we can see him. That's how we get to heaven, by faith. And Jesus indicated, blessed are those unborn generations that are yet to come that have never seen me, and yet they believe. 
I cannot prove to you Jesus. I cannot prove to you even the existence of God. I accept him by faith. And when I do, he does all that he's promised to do. He changes my life. He makes me a new person. But it's all by faith. Now I walk by faith. Now I live by faith. But then my faith will give way to sight when he is revealed. What a glorious day that's going to be. And then another word that is used is apocalypsis, which means unveiling. It's the unveiling of one who's been hidden. Today is a day in which Christ is hidden. But in that day, he will be revealed. Won't that be a glorious time when we shall see him? And I want to tell you, he is going to reign. He is going to rule. And don't you ever think that God has forgotten this world. We are facing a crisis over Berlin that is frightening the world. We are facing a crisis all over the world as the world is exploding everywhere. And many people are wringing their hands. And this author in the book On the Beach is expressing the utter pessimism of the human race today. A human race without God. A human race that has lost hope. A human race in despair. But to those of us that know Jesus Christ, there is no pessimism. There is optimism because we know that the church shall triumph. We know that his prayer that he prayed that we sang a moment ago is going to be answered. He prayed the prayer, thy kingdom come. Do you think that Jesus ever prayed a prayer that will not be answered? I tell you, his kingdom shall come. A great and glorious kingdom. I don't know all the details of it, and I certainly would not bego, ya, bego, go beyond divine holy scripture in speculation. I only know that we are promised that there is coming a day when he shall appear, and when he shall come no longer as he came the first time, he came in Bethlehem's manger. There wasn't even a place to lay his head. I know that he went to the cross and died and hung on that cross. And when he did, 72,000 angels drew their swords and they were ready to come to his rescue. But he said, Father, forgive them. That is, the people that were murdering him. Forgive them. They know not what they do. And I tell you, that prayer was answered too. They were forgiven. And he died on the cross. And it was a glorious day when he was raised again. It was a glorious day when he ascended to the heavens. But the next time he comes, it will not be as a lowly man riding on a donkey. It'll not be in a stable. It'll not be as a simple carpenter. It will be as king of kings and lord of lords, riding triumphantly on his white horse and the angels following in his train. And man at that moment may be so worked up and so rebellious against God and so anti-God and one of the world's leaders recently said, someday our system is going to pull God out of the sky if we can find him. And one of our systems and countries said recently, we've sent a satellite into space. We have probed out of space and we haven't found God, therefore there is no God. <laughs> you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The stupidity, the foolishness, a man with a little satellite and he probes around and says there's no God. Do you know how many light years there are from horizon to horizon that you can see at night? Six million light years. 
from one end to the other. And we only send a little satellite up a minute or two into space. And we say there's no God. And someday we may declare war on God. Do you think that our puny armies and hydrogen bombs and scientific developments on this little tiny planet floating out into space could defeat the angels of God? I tell you, Michael the archangel alone, Gabriel the archangel alone can handle the whole world. He is coming! And he warns all the way through the scriptures to get ready. Prepare, for in such a day as ye think, not the Son of Man cometh. And that was one of the things about this book on the beach. The people of Melbourne just couldn't believe that it was coming. They couldn't believe that they were soon going to die of radioactive fallout. They couldn't believe it. But they did die. And thousands of them won for past. And then not only is it going to be a day of revelation, but secondly, it's going to be a day of condemnation. To Christians, it will be a time of ecstasy and joy and glory because we believed on him and now we're with him and we're reigning with him. But to those outside of Christ, it will be a day of condemnation. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, 9, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. I realize that this is not fashionable nor popular, but the Bible teaches that when he comes, it will be a day of judgment for those that have not obeyed or receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he classifies them in this passage of Scripture in two groups. First, those who do not acknowledge God as God. You may know God. You may realize there is a God, but you've never really committed your life to Him. He doesn't mean anything in your daily life. You might go to church just as you would go to a social club but you really never acknowledged his son. You've never come in repentance of your sin. You've never come in humility and acknowledged that God has a claim on your life. To you, the scripture says it will be a day of condemnation and judgment. And then to those that have not responded to the preaching of the gospel, you've heard the gospel preached. And here in Australia, every person by radio or television can hear the gospel. In the United States, every person can hear the gospel. And anyone that rejects or neglects it is not ready for that great day that is yet to come. We are not prepared to meet our God. The scripture says in Amos 4, 12, prepare to meet thy God. I ask you today, are you prepared for that day? And the scripture says, in the Revised Standard Version, translates verse 9 this way, exclusion from the presence of God. Here is the terrible part about hell. In that moment, every person outside of Christ will see Christ. The Bible says that every eye will see. You will get a brief glimpse of his glory his majesty, his power, and then you will be excluded from his presence forever, the scripture says. In other words, you will have a moment in which you catch a glimpse of what you've missed. You'll see his beauty. It will dazzle you. And you will say, my God, my God, why didn't I give my life to Christ when I had an opportunity? But now it's too late, and you see him for a second. That's the meaning of this passage. There are three things I'd like to say about hell, if I might. Because hell actually is here and now, but it's also in the future, and basically hell means separation from God. 
But there are three words used in the Bible about hell that disturb many people. The first one is the second death. The Bible talks about continually the second death. Now, what does that mean? God is the source of all life. He is life with a capital L, L-I-F-E. He is life. There is no life apart from him. Now, the second death means that you are separated from that life. Hell is separation from God. Now, there are thousands of people right here before me in this great music bowl that are separated from God now. You have not committed your life to Jesus Christ. You've not surrendered your soul to Christ. Therefore, right now, there is a sense in which you are already enduring the pangs of hell. And then the second word that is used in the Bible that disturbs many people is fire. I don't have time to go into it now, all the details of it, whether it's a literal fire or what it is, except this. Fire indicates a tremendous thirst, a thirst for God. Jesus said, I am the water of life. And there are thousands of people right now that are thirsting for God and you don't even know it. You're wanting peace, joy, happiness. You haven't found it. You're thirsting for God. You're questing for God. Now, when you die, you're excluded from the presence of God and this thirst for God is intensified. But here's the difference. You can satisfy it now but you cannot satisfy that thirst then. When that day comes, it will be too late. And then the third word that is used in Scripture to describe hell is outer darkness. The Scripture says that Christ is light. L-I-G-H-T. He is light. Everything else is darkness spiritual darkness. He is light. He radiates light. God is perfect light. And to be excluded from his presence is darkness, out of darkness, banished into darkness forever. That's hell and much more. It will be a day of condemnation to those that have refused the gospel. You've heard the gospel preached in this series of meetings here in Melbourne. And you've deliberately rejected Christ or you have neglected to re take advantage of your opportunity and receive him as Savior. To you, it will be a day of judgment and condemnation when he comes. And then lastly, thirdly, it will be a day of salvation. A day of glorious salvation. That's the day when all of us that are alive and remain shall be caught up, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the day when the graveyards are going to burst open, and every person that has died in Christ is going to rise again. You say the Apostles' Creed in your church on Sunday, don't you? We believe in the resurrection of the dead. You read it in your prayer book. The resurrection of the dead, but you've heard it all your life and it means nothing to you. I tell you, there's going to be a resurrection. And all of those loved ones of yours that have died in the past in Christ, they knew Christ as their Savior, they are going to be raised. And there's going to be a glorious and grand reunion in that day. And Jesus Christ is going to set up his kingdom. The communists say they're going to rule the world. I tell you, they will not. If they do rule, it will only be for a short time. Because the rightful ruler 
is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of David. He shall someday sit on his throne and rule and reign. And what a time it's going to be when we shall reign with him. Are you ready for that day? What is heaven? Heaven is going to be wherever Christ is. We're not told in scriptures exactly where heaven is. We're not told all about heaven. But we are told that Jesus is there now preparing mansions for us. But we're also told that heaven is where he is. And heaven is described in terms that indicates that the important thing will not be our joy, but will be his joy. He will be so revealed in beauty and glory in and through his, those that have followed him that the whole universe will marvel. Now you ask me if I think there's life on other planets? I personally think there probably is. I have no proof. There are a few hints in the Bible, though, that there probably is. But I know this. There are many other creatures in the universe that we read about in the Scriptures. The angels. The seraphim. All the great beings of Scripture. And the Bible teaches that in that day, when he is crowned King of kings and Lord of lords, in the great and magnificent coronation, It'll be a day of his joy. When he went to the cross to die for our sins, it was for the joy that was set before him. He saw in vision that glorious day when this world system will have come to an end and it will have all been climaxed in that coronation of himself when all of those that he redeemed and saved will be with him. And the universe will marvel that he could take a sinner like you and me, a person that had rebelled against God, a person that had broken God's laws, a person that had lived for himself, a person that had disregarded God, a person that had done all sorts of things that were wrong, that God could take them and not only forgive them, but take them up, up, up beyond the angels and make them children of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ to reign with him. The universe will gasp at the grace and the mercy and the glory of God and the universe will sing and they will chant their anthems of praise to the Lamb that was slain. What an hour that's going to be. What a hope there is. I tell you, when you die, that's not the end of it. That's only the beginning. And the pages of our newspapers today are black indeed. But that does not disturb the child of God that has been to the cross and had his sins washed in that blood. The universe will marvel at the salvation. And the Bible says the morning stars will sing together. The Bible indicates the angels will chant their songs of praise and adoration for him. A craftsman down here is always revealed by the thing that he produces and makes. And so Christ is going to be glorified because of us. And while we are here as Christians living for him, we are to be conformed more and more into his image. That's called sanctification in the Bible growing more and more like Christ every day, growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ until we are becoming more like him, until we shall see him face to face in a very brief time. It won't be long before everybody listening to my voice will be in eternity. Why, if the end of the world doesn't come Today, by the climactic intervention of God or an atomic bomb war, it's going to come for you soon anyway. Why, what's 50 years? Nothing. 
What's ten years? Nothing. It'll all be over. As far as this world is concerned, you better be start thinking about the next world. And the Bible indicates that Christ will be the center of heaven. And in hell, wherever you look, you'll miss Christ. In heaven, all attention will be centered on him, Jesus Christ. And I want to ask you today, have you received him? Is he yours? The Bible says that this hope of his coming should cause us to watch. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. The Bible indicates that to us that know him, it should purify us. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. It should make us united as Christians and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. It should cause us to evangelize. Occupy till I come. Occupy with loving your neighbor. Occupy. Don't sit down and say, the Lord's coming. I'm just going to sit here and wait for his coming. No. That's sin against God. That's displeasing to God. Go back to your school. Go back to your home. Go back to your church. Go back to your social obligations. And work as you've never worked. Occupy till I come. Go down among the people. Help the poor. Love your neighbor, no matter what race he may be. Give food for the hungry. Get involved in the world in which we're living as a light and a shining testimony for Christ. Ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are the light of the world. Live for him. And this burning hope within you should make you live more intensely for him than ever before with far deeper commitment to him than ever before. Occupy till I come. But the question I ask you as I close is this. Do you know him as your Lord and Master and Savior? Are you ready for that day? If you're not, I'm going to ask you to get ready today. Now the first step that you take is to receive him. That's not the end of it because then you begin to grow in Christ. But you must start somewhere. You must start someday, somewhere, at some moment in your life when by faith you turn from your sins and receive Christ as Lord and Master. I'm going to ask you to do that today. There are hundreds of you here today that are not sure that you've received him. You may be identified with some church. You might have been confirmed or baptized, but you'd like to renew that vow. You'd like to make it real. You'd like to make it a heart commitment to him. You may not be identified with any church. You haven't really given your life to Christ ever. I'm going to ask you to come. Give your life to Christ and identify yourself with the church and live for him and say, I'll burn my sinful bridges behind me. I'm going to change my way of living. I'm going to live for Christ. I want to be his, and I want to be ready for that day.